In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Que eleison, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord bless us, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever, and unto the ages of all ages, amen. Make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thanksgiving prayer together. Let us give thanks to the beneficent and merciful God, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, for he has covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us unto him, spared us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Let us also ask him, the Lord our God, the Almighty, to guard us in all peace this holy day and all the days of our life. O Master, Lord, God, the Almighty, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for every condition, concerning every condition and in every condition. For you have covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us unto you, spared us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Therefore, we ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind, to grant us to complete this holy day and all the days of our life in all peace with your fear, all envy, all temptation, all the work of Satan, the counsel of wicked men, and the rising up of enemies, hidden and manifest. Take them away from us and from all your people and from this holy place that is yours. But those things which are good and profitable do provide for us, for it is you who has given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil. By the grace, compassion, and love of mankind of your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom the glory, the honor, the dominion, and the adoration are due unto you with him and the Holy Spirit, the life giver, who is one essence with you now and at all times and unto the ages of all ages. Amen. Psalm 50. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your great mercy, and according to the multitude of your compassion, blot out my iniquity. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my iniquity, and my sin is at all times before me. Against you only I have sinned and done evil before you, that you might be just in your sayings and might overcome when you are judged. For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sins my mother conceived me. For behold, you have loved the truth. You have manifested to me the hidden and unrevealed things of your wisdom. You shall sprinkle me with your hyssop, and I shall be purified. You shall wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. You shall make me to hear gladness and joy. The humble bones shall rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in my inward parts. Do not cast me away from your face and do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with the directing spirit. Then I shall teach transgressors your ways and the ungodly men shall turn to you. Deliver me from blood, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall rejoice in your righteousness. O Lord, you shall open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. For if you desired sacrifice, I would have given it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. A broken and humble heart God shall not despise. Do good, O Lord, in your good pleasure to Zion, and let the walls of Jerusalem be built. Then you shall be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness, offerings, and burnt sacrifices. Then they shall offer calves upon your altar. Alleluia. The sunset prayer of this blessed day we offer to Christ our King, our God, beseeching him to forgive us our sins. From the Psalms of our teacher David, the prophet and king, may his blessings be with us all. Amen. Psalm 116. Praise the Lord, all you nations, let all the peoples praise him. For his mercy has been established upon us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Alleluia. Psalm 122. Unto you I have lifted up my eyes, O you who dwell in heaven. Behold, as the eyes of servants are unto the hands of their masters, and as the eyes of a maid servant to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes are towards the Lord our God until he has pity on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt, and our soul has been exceedingly filled. Give the reproach to those who prosper and contempt to the proud. 
Alleluia. Holy, 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 the gospel according to St. Luke. May his blessings be with us all. Amen. Out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house, and Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they requested him concerning her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she arose and served them. When the sun was setting, all those who had any sick with divers diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are Christ the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. Glory to God forever. Amen. Ten oste moko becheres tos nem bek yoten aga sos nem bieb nev maet oem jaki ek soti monaina. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where shall I, the sinner, appear? The burden and heat of the day I did not endure because of the weakness of my humanity. But, O merciful God, count me with the fellows of the eleventh hour. For behold, in iniquities I was conceived, and in sins my mother bore me. Therefore, I do not dare to lift up my eyes to heaven, but rather I rely on the abundance of your mercy and love for mankind, crying out and saying, God, forgive me a sinner and have mercy on me. Hasten, O Savior, to open to me the fatherly bosoms, for I wasted my life in pleasures and lusts, and the day has passed by me and vanished. Therefore now I rely on the richness of your never-ending compassion. So then do not forsake a submissive heart which is in need of your mercy. For unto you I cry, O Lord, humbly, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son, so make me as one of your hired servants. <laughs> Every iniquity I did with prudence and activity, and every sin I committed with eagerness and diligence, and, and of all torment and judgment I am worthy. Therefore, prepare me for the ways of repentance, O Lady the Virgin. For to you I appeal, and through, through you I seek intercession, and upon you I call to help me, lest I might be put to shame. And when my soul departs, my body attend to me, and defeat the conspiracy of the enemies, and shut the gates of Hades lest they might swallow my soul, O you blameless bride of the true bridegroom. O Lord, hear us and have mercy on us and forgive us our sins. Amen. Holy, 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 Lord of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your holy glory. Have mercy on us, O God, the Father, the Almighty, O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. O Lord, God of hosts, be with us, for we have no helper in our hardships and tribulations but you. Absolve, forgive, and remit, O God, our transgressions, those which we have committed willingly and those which we have committed unwillingly, those which we have committed knowingly and those which we have committed unknowingly. The hidden and manifest, O Lord, forgive us for the sake of your holy name, which is called upon us. Let it be according to your mercy, O Lord, and not according to our sins. Make us worthy to pray. Thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
We thank you, our compassionate King, for you have granted us to pass this day in peace and brought us to the evening thankfully and made us worthy to behold daylight until evening. Lord, accept our glorification which is offered now. Save us from the trickeries of the adversary and abolish all the snares which are set against us. Grant us in this coming night peace without pain or anxiety or unrest or illusion so that we may pass it in peace and chastity and rise up for prayers and praises. Glorify your holy name together with the Father who is incomprehensible and without beginning, and the Holy Spirit, the life giver who is in one essence with you, now and at all times and unto the ages of all ages. Amen. Have mercy on us, O God, and have mercy on us, who at all times and every hour in heaven and on earth is worshipped and glorified. Christ our God, the good, the long-suffering, the abundant in mercy and the great in compassion, who loves the righteous and has mercy on the sinners of whom I am chief who does not wish the death of a sinner, but rather that he returns and lives, who calls all to salvation for the promise of the blessings to come. Lord, receive from us our prayers in this hour and in every hour. Ease our life and guide us to fulfill your commandments. Sanctify our spirits, cleanse our bodies, conduct our thoughts, purify our intentions, heal our diseases, forgive our sins, deliver us from every evil grief and distress of heart. Surround us by your holy angels that by their gain attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of your imperceptible and infinite glory for you are blessed forever amen oh lord make us worthy to pray thankfully our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come it will be done on And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for every man. Please be seated. Grant us in this coming night peace without pain. <laughs> Is there an Welcome everyone. If I can ask you in the back to come to the front or move forward. So you should be taking at least three chairs ahead of you. So if you're standing in one chair or sitting in one chair, take the third chair in front of you. Mary, you're fine. Mike, Gina. Okay, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, welcome, everyone. We continue with our Lenten lecture series. Uh, today is actually the third of four lectures. Uh, we started the Lenten lecture series Monday of last week, um, and this is now have, has become an annual tradition for us. I believe this may be the fourth or the fifth uh, Lenten lecture series for our church. Um, and we were blessed uh, to pick the theme, Stories of Transformation. Um, the first lecture, uh, we were blessed uh, when we had uh, Monica Mina speak to us on uh, conversion stories. 
um, and what it takes to, con to be converted. Uh, then we had Father Carlos Ibrahim this past Thursday, who spoke to us on um, also uh, conversion through God's mercy. Um, and today we are blessed to have with us Dr. Mariam Zekert. Uh, Dr. Mariam, if, if you are following our Bible studies, um, uh, lectures us um, every Thursday regarding uh, the Gospel of John. Prior to that, it was the Gospel of uh, Luke, and prior to that, it was the Gospel of Mark. Um, so tonight, uh, Dr. Mariam is going to speak to us on daily transformations. Uh, so please welcome Mariam over. Alrighty. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Miriam. For those of you who don't know me, um, so I know I've been already kind of introduced the last two weeks, so I, I won't reiterate that. So, um, sorry, let me just. Okay. So there's a lot of talks about careers, um, career transformation, mindfulness, self betterment, and all the things that the world tells us are important. Um, and the world tries to confuse us with what true and real transformation is all about. And today we're going to talk about that transformation. Um, we're going to talk about transformation um, that is eternal and the transformation back to our original form. And this week we'll be defining transformation from a different lens, what it entails, and discussing some of the individuals in the Bible who underwent transformation. Um, so we'll begin. So I do tend to um, just uh, to repeat some of the things that the church fathers said, but I try to break them down for you. So if you have any questions, I'm open especially to repeating some of the quotes that the church fathers said, so just let me know. So I'll start off um, kind of giving some definitions of transformation. Um, so St. Cyril of Alexandria gives us this beautiful quote, and I'm going to just divide it up like I said. Um, so he says, human beings choose their own way of life. So there's a choice and are entrusted with the reins of their own intelligence so as to follow whatever course they wish, either towards the good or toward the contrary. And so here he's telling us that you have a choice to choose the course your life takes. You can choose the life of righteousness or not. And this is where our free will is. He continues and says, but our original created nature has implanted in it a zealous desire for whatever is good and the will to concern itself with goodness and righteousness. So he's saying that our original, our original nature desires that which is good and desires to do the things that are righteous. This is our original state and this is our identity. And in talking about transformation, I think, and this will come up throughout the talk today, um, understanding our identity and our calling. So he continues to say, for this is what we mean by saying that humanity is in the image and likeness of God, that the creature is naturally disposed to do what is good and right. So he explains to us what it means to be in the image and likeness of God. We are naturally disposed to do what is good and right. This is, um, this is what transformation is all about. It's about transforming back to our original nature. And each and every single one of us has this inside us. And it's important to understand that we were created in the image and likeness of God. Understanding our roots and our foundations and our identity will help us in the process of transformation. I think in defining transformation, um, defining asceticism is an important part of it. So I'm going to go about doing that. Um, in one of St. Matthew the Poor's books, he gives a really nice definition of asceticism that I feel I've carried over the last couple of years. Um, so he says, asceticism is the constant working towards conforming the human will and mind to the will and mind of God. So I'll repeat that. It's the constant working um, towards conforming the human will and mind to the will and mind of God. The ultimate aim of the Christian life is union with God. So the definition of asceticism is our calling as Christians. 
We are constantly trying to work to conform our mind and our will so that it is in line with God's will and God's mind. And when my will is one way and God's will is in another way, there's disharmony. And, it, and you feel it inside you. There's lack of peace. Whereas when I, my will and my mind is united with God's, I am in the original form that he wanted me to be in, and I experience a life of peace and joy. So St. Clement of Alexander explains us how and when this union begins. And he says the union begins from the first moment in the life with God. So he tells us from this very first moment, you are united with God. And so there's no question about, am I united with God? Am I not? Does he want to be with me? And we're going to get into that too. Because um, I think sometimes our mind can play some tricks on us um, and make us believe things that are not true. And so he continues to say, um, St. Clement of Alexandria continues to say, through obedience, um, through obedience to the commandments in an attempt to submit human will to God and attain a submission that slowly conforms one mind, uh, sorry, confirms one to the mind of God. So how does this unity begin? Or how does it happen? I'm sorry, because we already said it begins the moment you um, encounter God. But when, how does it begin? It begins, uh, or how does it happen, I'm sorry, through obedience to the commandments and through submitting my will to God's will. So the unity is already there. You are united to God, but you have a choice whether to remain united to God or to say, no, nope, I don't want you, or I don't want to follow this path, and we'll get into that as well. Um, so again, here we see this concept of conforming our mind and our will so that it is in line with God's. So. There was one other part um, in what he said, and he says that slowly conforms one to the mind of God. And so it's important to know that transformation can be a journey. For each of us, it's going to look different. Um, but it can, it's a, no matter what, it's a lifelong process. And one must realize that to change ourselves and to live this sanctified life, it's a daily process. And it's an active process. Um, and for some people, it may happen in a moment where they've encountered someone or they went on a trip or you hear various stories. Each, one, each person has their own story. In God's wisdom, he writes our stories differently because he knows that each of us have a different way of thinking. Have, he takes into account every part of us. Um, but no matter what, the, you have to live the rest of your life with him. So you have to constantly these daily transformations. That's why the name of the talk is Daily Transformations. So does that mean it's going to be a smooth ride? Not necessarily. There's going to be ups and downs. And you may fall, but it's crucial to get back up. In a sermon I was recently listening to, the priest was saying how this person had come to confess and then returned a month later and hadn't committed the same sin. Um, but felt the need to confess it again. And the priest said, responded and said that you don't fully, and this is for all of us, but we don't fully understand that it is erased. Once it's repented, it is erased. And we're basically saying to God, I don't trust that you've forgiven me. So don't let the things that maybe make you stumble um, keep you and hinder you from living this life of transformation. And I think that's a really important thing for each of us to think about um, because it can, it can really hinder our relationship with God. And we're going to get to that um, maybe in the next part, but we'll go into a little more detail in a second. So in 1 Corinthians 9.24, it says, Do you not know that those who run in a race run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And um, when I was reading the commentary on this, St. Clem Clement of Alexandria literally wrote, no effort, no crown. And I laugh right now, but it's, it's so true. It's just like a simple statement. Don't put the effort, you don't get the crown. And obviously God's mercy plays a role in it. Um, but the point is that it takes work. Our spiritual life takes work. And what is the meaning of liturgy? What does that word mean? I think I heard it. Yeah, the work of the people. Same. So it's, yeah, all of our spiritual life takes work. But that work is very fulfilling. 
And we'll get to that part as well in a little bit. Um, so I'll add a little bit to that actually. Um, the work that we put in, the little that we put in, God blesses abundantly. And so if you think about the five loaves and two fish, same thing, like God runs with the little bit of effort that you put in. He's just so happy to sit in your presence and we don't even give him enough time and he welcomes us with wide opened arms. Um, and I wanted to add one thing in that sometimes we may not feel um, like as humans, we may not feel the change right away. Does that mean that it's not happening? Doesn't necessarily mean it's not happening. If we're, God is always pursuing us and if we're putting in the effort, God is blessing that effort. And it's kind of like if you um, change your diet and start exercising, it doesn't mean like the next day you're gonna be pounds down or have a six pack, it takes effort, it takes work. And that's like everything in our life. Everything takes work. And we put so much work and effort into all of these aspects of our life, our careers, our families, our relationships, our social status. And then it makes me wonder how, how much do we actually give to God? How much have I committed of my life to transforming my life? Um, we're okay with changing for everything else. But do we change for God? Have we committed to him? And have we decided that we want to change for him? Or am I willing to change everything in my lifestyle so I pass that test? Everything in my lifestyle so that I fit into that group? Everything in my lifestyle so I, whatever it may be, right? Um, and something for each of us to think about, especially over these next couple of weeks, uh, the last couple of weeks of the Lent, um, whether I've actually made that decision, if, even if I've thought about it, maybe I haven't really thought about it. I thought I was committed to God, and then I'm like, oh, actually, I guess I really haven't had a transformation yet. But there's still time, and that's the beauty of our relationship with God, is that there's, he always gives us a chance. Um, okay. So in Philippians 3, 12 through 14, it says, not that I've already attained or am already perfected. Sorry. Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's a couple of things here. Um, so one, um, forgetting the things that are behind us, meaning the things of this world, and pressing towards the heavenly things. And that's, that's my choice, whether I want to continue to pursue the earthly things, um, and I feel like I've hinted at this multiple times, but we'll get there in a second, um, and make the choice of leaving those things behind and being committed to this heavenly journey with God. Um, in a meditation by St. Augustine, he talks about how St. Paul is both perfect and imperfect. And I like this because I think this applies to all of us. He's imperfect in that there's still righteousness to be had, but he's perfect in that he confesses, and he says this, confesses his own imperfection and makes good progress in order to attain it. And so he's perfectly imperfect, and I know that's the name of a song, but, um, but that's for each of us, right? We have this opportunity to be this perfectly imperfect person um, as long as we are committed to him. Um, so, and he, he, he says, St. Augustine says, you're, you're running the race, but you're not perfect. And that's okay. That is not a bad thing. Um, and the, the spiritual journey doesn't require perfection. It's okay if you slip up. As long as you confess, you stand back up, and, and we hear this, right? But we're so easy to pull ourselves, stay on the floor, and not be able to get up, and then we grow distance from God. Um, so I'll ask you guys, what hinders me from experiencing this life of transformation? What are some of the things that you think hinder you? Mm -hmm. So thoughts of not being worthy, okay. Agreed. Anyone else? 
I have a whole list, but I figured I'd ask you guys. <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah. Postponing and doing it another time. Yeah. And that's like, um, you reminded me of, and sorry, I didn't mean to go on a tangent, um, but you remind me of this talk where the, it was actually a book, um, where the tactic of the devil was to kind of keep having this person push off, push off, push off the thing that they were supposed to do to gain, um, to become more spiritual. And he'd be like, oh, it's okay. Do tomorrow. Or he would give them a spirit of laziness. Um, but tangent, anyway, sorry. What else? What else hinders us from experiencing this life of transformation and transforming ourselves? Distractions and temptations. Yeah, agreed. Yep. Anyone else? Yeah. Guilt, yeah. And, and that, that's really important. That's what I was getting to before. And um, I'm not sure if you're talking about specifically about sin or what it may be, but yeah, like staying on the floor. And that's so not what God wants us to do. It's, it's funny because the devil wants us, um, I don't remember the exact wording, but again, this was something I'd recently read, but basically the devil like pushes us to be obedient to him, to commit the sin, and then he leaves us in the state of guilt afterwards. So either way, um, it's a loss, unfortunately. But that is not what Christ wants for us. He wants us to get back up. And we'll get to that too later on um, when we talk about some of the examples of transformation. Um, I could take like one or two more if you want, or I could just kind of list them off. Anyone else? Okay. So some of the things that I was thinking about, is, um, which a lot of you have mentioned, is I like the things of this world too much. God is too strict. He doesn't want me to have fun. I struggle with sin. I particularly struggle with this one sin, and I, I just can't figure out how to get over it. I don't feel anything when I talk to God. God hasn't given me the things I want. I don't understand why he wouldn't give me this. I'm overwhelmed with the burdens and pain from this life. And I was very candid in saying these things um, because a lot of us have faced these thoughts. And it can cause a huge distance and become a very big barrier in our relationship with God. Um, and we can grow not to trust God. And that's probably the worst thing that could happen to us and will totally prevent us from having a life of transformation. And so the devil tricks us into believing that God is not for us or that I'm not good enough or that he doesn't care about me and on and on and on. And it could be down this rabbit hole. And the reality is that God loves you very much and he is uh, the Pantocrator, he's the Almighty, and he wants good for you. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So I want you each to think about the state of the inner room, the room that nobody knows about inside you. It can be affected by the things um, that some of you have mentioned, um, or some of the things that are kind of listed off, whether it's the hurts, the desires, the past wounds, the burdens, um, and think about how you deal with those. And um, there's a book called Elements, and I haven't finished it, but it's very, very good. I'm reading it currently. And I really like this one part in it. Um, it says, humans aren't very creative. They medicate their hurt with the very things that wounded their nature in the beginning, which then leads them in a worse state than before. And this idea of medicating ourselves is very true. We often will medicate with ourselves, whether it's with the thing that we initially used to hurt ourselves or with a new thing. And it's kind of like, I, I don't know how to deal with this pain, so I'm going to self-medicate. I'm going to do everything I can to avoid this emotion. And again, that's not, maybe, that's not what God wants for us. And he doesn't want us to self-medicate with sin, too. Um, so I think the first thing, and the reason I mention these things is because I think it's really important to recognize these things about yourself and to spend time figuring out what are the things that are hindering you from a relationship with God. Because awareness is the first step. Recognizing, spending time with God, spending time thinking about these things, and then leaving them at the foot of the cross and just leaving them at 
in God's hands and asking him to help you. And, and this is where the dialogue begins, the communication. And this is the transformation that begins to happen. Um, and I, I love this um, quote by one of the church fathers. For the weight of earthly master, uh, sorry, I'll repeat that, so sorry. For the weight of earthly matters gradually destroys the strength of their servants. So the weight of the things that are earthly here, they, they gradually destroy us. But the weight of Christ rather helps the one who bears it. So Christ helps the one who bears it. Because we do not bear grace, grace bears us. It is not for us to help grace, but rather grace has been given to aid us. And this is a crucial part about this, is that we have grace. And Christ helps carry those burdens, those wounds, whatever it may be that's preventing us from having this transformation or living this spiritual life. What appears to be too heavy in the human mind or the human eyes isn't too heavy for Christ. And so whatever you're carrying or bearing, bring it to Christ. Um, and I, I like this part where he says, it's not for us to help grace, but rather grace has been given to aid us. Grace is already there and it's already given. It's freely given and you are worthy of it. Um, and it's our choice to take it and not to keep self-medicating and um, participating in those things that are really breaking our relationship with God. Um, sorry, one second. Okay. Okay, sorry. Okay, so I was reading a little bit about grace, and I, I particularly like the way this author defined grace, so I'll read it. He says, grace is a free gift given to support that person's weak will that often deviates and experiences constant needs. And the reason I like this definition, uh, this definition is because, one, it, it obviously says that it's a free gift and that we are supported through it, but it also, in a sense, like, it from a human to human kind of thing, like it empathizes with our weakness that sometimes deviates. And so we can deviate from that. And we do have certain needs, but there is grace and grace carries us through those times. And um, it's all about, part of it is all about submitting. So um, the next part I wanted to kind of talk about was um, emphasizing Christ in, in welcoming us back home. And the reason I use the word back home is because it's actually the words of Christ, and I'll read it. In John 14, he says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And this is where Christ is supposed to live, within us. And we'll, we'll get to the, the verse, the kingdom of God is within you. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but imagine having to choose between a mansion and a dump to live in. It seems like a very easy choice when we talk about it right now. But in our day to day, I'm not sure it's as easy of a decision for us. Sometimes we easily choose the dump, not realizing that it's a dump. Um, but I think, again, like putting things into perspective and saying, oh, I think I actually do choose the dump more often than the mansion. Um, so we choose our t ourselves often. And in choosing ourselves, um, it's never enough. And it's never enough because it was nothing in this world was meant to fulfill us. Um, OK. So OK. So. In Romans 8, 28, it says, all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And St. John Chrysostom says that God can make things um, that appear painful to appear light and turn them into things which can be helpful. And that's really important. It doesn't matter what the past comes with. Um, it can be turned to good. So... I think part of understanding our transformation also is understanding where we belong and where our citizenship is. And this can become through a feeling where maybe you don't feel like you fit in in this world 
or it can come through um, believing and knowing that you're not meant to live in this world and you're not a member of this world. And understanding our citizenship and understanding that we are heirs and that we are sons and daughters of God is really important in the process of transformation because that's who we are. And so this is again I, uh, understanding our identity. Um, so in Philippians it says, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the church father kind of talks about how we aren't meant to live amidst the earthly things, but rather the heavenly things. And it's things for us to think about. Am I, in, am I living amongst the earthly things or am I, is my mind always on the earthly things or is it on the heavenly things? And just, I tend to ask those questions as rhetorical questions, but things for you guys to think about tonight and over the next couple of weeks especially, um, as you meditate and pray. Um, okay. So I had mentioned that we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. So in Luke 17, 21, it says, Christ says, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. And one of the um, definitions of that, it comes with understanding that you have an opportunity to be truly holy even in the flesh. And um, the, a person can be, sorry, can, can be converted and transformed by having conversations with heaven. And, and this is quoted from one of the church fathers, but having conversations with heaven, following his commandments, and choosing the things of the spirit. And you can take, and we'll kind of talk about a little, a few practical steps at the end, um, but again, just being wholly converted to the spirit, um, that is the meaning of the kingdom of God within us. So I think we had kind of talked about this, so I won't reiterate, but um, in, in talking before with one of your examples, um, we also often give ourselves excuses. I'll fast next week. I'll read my Bible tomorrow. I'm really tired. I'll sleep in today. Um, I, I don't think this is cheating. I can do this. I can have this today. Um, I was going to fast this morning, but I'm not going to, right? We make excuses for ourselves. I'm too tired. I have too much on my plate, whatever it may be. And we all fall into this trap. And especially these next couple of weeks, I'm, you know, there's there's going to be even more temptations as um, Easter approaches, but um, fasting is about suppressing our desires of the flesh. And so um, think about some of the excuses that you give yourself and maybe even just choose one thing that you feel like you've really um, been giving excuses for and say, you know what, this, these next couple of weeks I'm not going to give myself excuses for this. So. Um, next, we'll talk about how, um, and, and talk about the kingdom of God, but how Christ comes to us, and he's the one who wants us. And um, St. Cyril of Alexander says, naturally, every impulse which leads to righteousness comes from God the Father. Christ himself once said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And so Christ meets us where we are. He actively pursues us, and he wants a relationship with us. And we see this in countless examples in the Bible, and so we'll go in through a couple of examples of um, saints, and I'm not going to go through their story, uh, not, not going to go through their stories, but um, a lot of them are tied into some of the Bible readings that we've read over the last few Sundays in Lent. So the first person, and I is the meditation on the prodigal son, and like I said, I'm not going to read this story, um, but I'll give... I'm going to use one verse in that story. In Luke 15, 20, it says, But when he was still a great way off, the father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. In the meditation about this verse, St. Ambrose says, He who hears you pondering in the secret places of the mind runs to you. When you are still far away, he sees you and he runs to you. He sees in your heart, he runs, and he embraces you. And I just like want you to picture like Christ literally seeing you far away 
and imagine him running you and embracing you despite being covered in mud with a foul smell. Um, and he's just so joyous to see you. Um, this is the sweetness of God. He meets us even in our muddy, dirty state. Um, and he kisses us and embraces us. And he's not scared of the things or turned off or um, any of those things deterred from us as a result. And St. Ambrose continues and says, his foreknowledge is in the running, his mercy in the embrace, and the disposition of fatherly love. And I'm not going to focus on the mercy part because I know that Abuna Krilos uh, focused on that last week, but I love this meditation, his mercy is in the embrace. And despite whatever I come with, he is merciful and he embraces me. And his disposition of fatherly love, what does that mean? He, he's not angry, he's not upset, he's just so full of love and just so happy to see each, each one of us returning to him. Um, and the last part of his meditation says, he falls on, on your neck to raise one prostate and burdened with sins and brings back one turned aside to the earthly towards heaven. And so he sees us and he turns us from he sees that we are in this earthly state and he embraces us so that we can be turned into a person, um, a, a spiritual person or a heavenly person. Um, another person in the Bible is Zacchaeus. And before I read the story, the short couple of verses of Zacchaeus, I, does anyone know what Zacchaeus' occupation was? Yeah. And what what were tax collectors, what was their role back in the day? You know? They did, but why? So they were hired by the Romans to collect the taxes and they didn't get a wage. And so what they would do is they would take extra money for themselves so that they could get money, but they would do it unfairly and they totally abused the system. So they, in the sense, that's, that's why they were sinners. And so that's why you see the Pharisees saying, why are you eating with the sinners and the tax collectors? So Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And um, first we see that Zacchaeus is eager to meet the Lord. And I'll, I'll read this quote uh, from the Bible, or this verse from the Bible. It says, and he sought to see who Jesus was, but not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. And then in verse 5 it says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So all it says is, Zacchaeus sought to see who Jesus was. He just wants to see who Jesus was. And he climbs this tree, um, probably really not expecting this response from God, or from Christ, and Christ sees him in the midst of a crowd. I mean, I can't imagine. I know he's on a tree, but he's like, you, I'm going to dine with you. I'm coming to your house today. And Christ does the same thing with us. He finds us in the crowd, and he, Zacchaeus had just a little desire to see Christ, and Christ is like, nope, I'm coming over. And it's the same with us. The little that we give, the little time that we spend with God, he embraces it, and he does, he runs with it. Um, I, a few more minutes and we'll be done, sorry. Um, okay, so I think, um, okay, maybe I'll skip over something. Okay, um, I think one of the things, and I should have mentioned this before, but one of the things that hinders us is not hearing God's voice. And because we're so attuned with, um, so we're so not attuned with God's voice, or because we are so invested in the things of this world that we can't even hear, um, we can't hear God in the midst of the loud and the, the things that are screaming at us. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because you may say, Zacchaeus, um, like Christ chose Zacchaeus. What it, maybe he won't do the same with me. And I want you to know that just because he pointed at Zacchaeus, it doesn't mean that he's not pursuing each and every single one of us. It doesn't mean that 
Um, he, he's not calling on each one of us. He is. But in a way that he knows is best for you, in his wisdom. And that was what I was talking about before. For everyone, their transformation story may be a little different. And that's okay. It may come through an encounter. It may come through um, a trip. It may, come, may become a very slow journey. It may be, come from one time in liturgy. I don't know what your transformation um, is going to look like. And if it's a slow process, that's okay too, because God knows that's what's best for you. Um, okay. So the, how many more minutes do I have? Okay, I'll keep it at like five. <laughs> I was gonna, uh, I will kind of run through these last two examples. But so, again, another person that we see is the Samaritan woman, right? And here we see that, um, and the reason I bring her up is because, again, I'm trying to make this point that Christ is invested in building a relationship with you. He says he needed to go through Samaria. And um, Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, Give me a drink. And St. Maximus says, he was, not thirsty, not, he was thirsty not for the water of this world, but for the redemption of the human race. And this is what Christ wants. He wants us to be redeemed. He wants us to build a relationship with him. Um, and St. Maximus continues to say that she returns full of holiness. She returns without a burden. Um, and we too have this opportunity to return uh, full of holiness and without a burden. Um, okay, and the last example I'll give is um, St. Matthew. So one of the things um, that I don't think maybe we emphasize enough is that he was a tax collector um, named Levi. So we already defined what a tax collector was. And St. Cyril of Alexandria really emphasizes who Levi was. I'm going to read this. Um, he says, Levi was a publican, a man greedy for dirty money, filled with an uncontrolled desire to possess, careless of justice in his eagerness to have what did not belong to him. Such was the characters of the publican. And so he lists off, I, I think, you know, we don't realize that how, what, how the tax collectors were seen and what the depth of their sin. But then there's transformation, and that's the beauty of it. Um, so, and, you know, as I was thinking about him, I was like, you know, with rising costs and inflation, like, what, how would we treat that person if that person was in our church? And I, I hope that we would treat them with love. And so it's something, again, to think about in the process of a transformation is how we treat others. And so St. Cyril continues to say, yet he was snatched from the workshop of sin itself and saved when there was no hope for him at the call of Christ the Savior of us all. And so we too have this calling and we too have this opportunity to be saved by Christ. Um, and he when Christ approaches him, he asks, he tells him, follow me. And it says he got up, left everything, and followed Jesus. And so the choice is ours. The choice is ours to get up and leave everything and to follow Christ and um, to get this opportunity to live a life of peace, to live a life with him, and to live an eternity with him. And the last couple of things I'll go over is um, in ask, when I ask about this choice, I, I wanted to ask for us to think about, do we recognize our need for God? And um, St. John Chrysostom says, God does not need us at all and still loves us very much. Whereas we desperately need him, but do not accept his love. And then he tells us what we prefer, preferring money, human friendship, physical comfort, power and glory, in spite of the fact that he prefers nothing to us. And that last part is like really powerful. He prefers nothing to us, and yet we choose everything else in the world but him. And we're all searching for fulfillment in this world. I'll be happy when I get this, and then you get this, and somehow it's still not enough. And then it's like, oh, I'll be happy when I get this, or when I accomplish this, or when I achieve this. And then you get there, and it's happiness, and then it's temporary, and then it's fleeting. And you go through your whole life like this. This life was never meant to fill us. 
true joy comes from Christ. Um, every day we ask um, in the Lord's Prayer, give us our daily bread. And so ask God to give you your daily bread to carry you through the day, to help you overcome the temptations, to give you wisdom to make the right decisions, to help strengthen you. Um, whatever it is, or just ask him simply, whatever I need to live a virtuous life with you, give me my daily bread to carry me through this day. Um, and one of the church fathers uh, meditates on the daily bread and he says, the true bread is that which nourishes the true humanity, the person created after the image of God. That bread, whether it's the Eucharist or the daily bread that we ask for in our prayer, is meant to nourish us. And this goes back to what we talked about in the beginning about defining transformation, about us being created in the image of God. Um, so, some, some more additional practical things, and we'll conclude in a couple of minutes. Um, immersing your thing, yourself in the things that are holy. Um, and in Philippians 4, 8, it goes over uh, the things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely. Meditate on these things. And that could be done through spending more time in prayer, reading the Bible or Igbeya, listening to sermons, even changing your music routine. Maybe just giving up a few minutes of listening to your music if, if you're listening to pop or rap or something or during your workout, whatever it may be, during your walk. Maybe listen to a spiritual sermon or Christian music or a hymn, whatever it may be. Um, trusting in the power of prayer. And we talk about prayer like a Sunday school answer, but we often don't live a life of prayer. And so live a life of prayer. And that can be just simple, medi simple prayers couple of times just start off simple like a couple of times during the day a simple prayer but just to continue that com line of communication with God um, so the journey of transformation does take daily efforts but it, it will be the most fulfilling because it is it leads you to uh, fulfilling your identity and to coming to your identity and to transforming your life so that you can live with Christ in eternity and um, Lastly, I'll conclude with submitting our will to God. And submitting our will can be pretty challenging sometimes, especially when we want something or when we feel like we could write the story better. And that is, again, the farthest from the truth. Um, he has a plan for each of our lives, and he's writing the story, and let him write the story. And um, I say this from experience because I know it can be kind of hard sometimes when you want your life to look a certain way um, or you want to succeed in this a certain way, but trust that he has a good plan for your life and that he is the best author. Um, so may we reap uh, the fruits of the Lent and uh, may we be transformed in his image and likeness and glory be to God forever and ever, amen. Any questions? We have a couple of questions already, and if anybody has any more questions, you guys can go to city and put them in. Um, the first one is, on the things that hinder us, oftentimes I feel hindered by people in my life. How can I better navigate from hurting those in my life by choosing to be converted or transformed? Okay. Um, so I think um, setting boundaries is an important part of this. Um, so I don't know the depth of the relationship with this person, if they believe in God, if they're causing you to sin. Um, if, if they are causing you to sin, then it's probably best if you cut them out. Um, if they don't believe in God, but they're not causing you to sin, I'm not gonna comment on your relationship with them because I don't know the details of it. But um, regardless if there's someone that you feel is hindering your spiritual life um, and they need to stay in your life, setting boundaries I think is an important thing. And that can be um, if they're, they wanna go out late or they wanna go out um, on a Sunday morning saying, no, I gotta go to church or I can't stay out late, especially during the Lenten season, because I, I need to spend time with God today. And if they're causing 
you to sin than just saying, no, I, I can't participate in these activities. Or if you feel like they're really um, causing you to be te overly tempted, then this is where um, choosing God first is really important. And so, again, I don't know the depth, what this relationship looks like, but just know that you are um, committed to God first and foremost. I don't know if you have something to add. Okay. And if you have a follow-up question, you can just type it on Menti if I didn't answer that or didn't understand the question. The next question is, what is the remedy to stubbornness? Remedy to stubbornness. Um, so, pretty broad question, I'll say. Um, I, I don't know if you mean stubbornness with God or stubbornness in your relationship with people. I'll say in stubbornness with God, um, and I don't mean this in a Sunday school answer, but prayer works wonders. Um, God can change the state of your inner heart um, even if you feel like you can't. And I, this is what I was saying before, I think we underestimate the power of prayer and living a life of prayer. And we like doing things, going to church, going to the meeting, going to this, fasting, but then there's no line of communication. Um, if there's a more, uh, if I didn't answer your question or didn't understand what you meant by stubbornness, you can ask the question. And again, Abuna, Uncle Smear, please chime in. Any other questions, if anybody else has any questions? We have a couple of comments in the Menti. The first one is, thanks for quoting the Church Fathers. Very refreshing to hear them in a contemporary topic. Um, and the other comment is from a person named John Barakat, who just wants to embarrass you by saying, I watched from Kelly and wonderful job. Thanks. So I think that's a great point to end. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions I can answer? Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank yeah. you so much for coming out here. I know you're a doctor and you're very busy. Uh, it's good to see everyone, all the new and returning faces. It's a really good turnout. Let's keep it up, guys. We've got a few announcements. Uh, we have liturgy tomorrow, Matt and start at 4 p.m. Uh, the last Lenten, Lenten lecture series by our very own Justin Gergs. Is today to, oh, today's Tuesday, tomorrow's Tuesday. Sorry, Wednesday, I'm sorry. Wednesday's liturgy at 4 p.m. matin start. This Thursday, the last Lenten lecture series by our very own Justin Gergs. He will be talking about the household of conversion. Um, these glasses clearly are not doing the job. Um, it starts at 7.45. On Friday, it will be our last uh, Friday of Lenten Liturgy. Matt and start at 10 a.m. So Saturday, we will have the Unction of the Sick. It starts at 7.30 a.m. And we will also have our the Eve of Palm Sunday Vespers. Those start at 5 p.m. And then on Sunday, obviously, Palm Sunday. Uh, liturgy starts at 7 a.m. and then the public funeral after. Um, next week's schedule is going to be a little jumbled up because it's Holy Week. The schedule will be on the email blast that goes out by Abuna. It will also be on social media. If you do not al uh, already follow us on social media, you can follow, follow us at SMSMNYC. Uh, and then uh, our mailing list is SMSMNYC.com. I think that's it. Right. All right, Abuna, you want to lead us? Please stand up for prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Through the intercessions of the Theotokos, Saint Mary, O Lord, grant us the forgiveness of our sins. We worship you, O Christ, Father.
Lord, make us worthy to pray. Thank for our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. The love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the fellowship and the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all.